In December, I was lucky enough to be invited onto the Extrology podcast hosted by Lee Cooper to discuss my book, What the Ruck Just Happened. So sit back and listen as we discuss how wild camping and the great outdoors helped me to come to terms with my epilepsy diagnosis. Enjoy. Today's podcast is brought to you by Progresso Talent Partners, who for more than 25 years have successfully delivered interim and permanent leadership talent to transform businesses. To hire the talent you need to enable your business to thrive, visit www.progressotalent.com today. Welcome listeners to a really exciting episode of Extrology. I'm delighted to have as my guest here today, Gareth De La Tour, author of a fantastic book, What the Ruck Just Happened. It's a really page-turning read. It's a fascinating read. And I want to start by introducing Gareth, by reading, and we debated this as to <laughs> what is the bit on the back of a book called? We've determined that the blurb seems to sum it up perfectly. I think so, yeah. Um, but I want to start with my uh, my introduction of Gareth by reading the blurb on the back of this, this fabulous book. Gareth once enjoyed a life that seemed almost perfect, a reality he didn't fully appreciate until a freak accident resulted in a severe head injury, leaving him grappling with debilitating epilepsy. This would change his life forever. What followed was a systematic loss of everything he knew, his health, his job, his friends, his marriage, and very nearly his life. In those darkest of times, Gareth found solace in his childhood passion for the outdoors and physical fitness. This deep-rooted love became his guiding light as he battled against depression and the challenges epilepsy imposed on his life. Gath's journey back to health is the embodiment of courage, perseverance, and triumph of the human spirit. In his own words, Gareth speaks of resilience, determination, and the healing potential found within ourselves when faced with life's greatest adventures. There are tales of adventure, endurance, and monumental comebacks, reminding us that the strength to rise again can be discovered through the pursuits that ignite our souls even when it appears that all hope is lost. I think that is a wonderful description of everything I've gotten to understand about you, captured in a brilliant book. So, Thank you. ladies and gentlemen, welcome Gareth de la Tour. Great to Hello. have you. <laughs> Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Good man, good man. How are you feeling this morning? We're good to go? We're, we're ready Absolutely to jump straight brilliant. in? Yeah, we've had a, a wonderful evening in Poole, and um, it's always nice to come and visit this part of the world as well, and uh, to obviously catch up with yourself. So, all good. Well, let's dive in. Questions. I think for context, it's always useful to understand the backstory. And I think the discovery of epilepsy, how you found out that you'd gotten epilepsy, I think would be really interesting for readers, for readers and listeners, frankly, thinking of the book, to understand. So, could you share the moment when first you found out that you'd epilepsy and what were your initial thoughts and feelings? Well, I ignored the fact for quite a long time. I'd, I'd had this bizarre accident at home, really, banging my head. And then as the days went on, I was just having these like blackouts. I took some time off work and I, I was just always one for like, oh, just walk it off, walk it off. You'll get better. Things will get better. And I was gradually getting worse. And um, uh, eventually I was forced into going to see a a doctor and I'd put that off for probably I don't know a month maybe you know of having these blackouts people saying I think you should really go and get yourself checked out and I was like no, I'll be fine but I had to get a letter um, to be able to take my children on holiday and um, uh, like a fit to fly letter so I, I went and saw a private consultant and um, he said yeah you're fit to fly because you're not traveling alone etc cetera, etc cetera. and he said um, I'm going to start you on um, anti-seizure or epilepsy medication and I need to see you when when you come back. And it hadn't even up until then crossed my mind. Uh, nobody, nobody had mentioned the pro that that might no, be a possible diagnosis. No, not at all. And we went away on holiday and um, the, these we were just calling them blackouts. They were getting worse and worse and worse. And um, when we returned, went back to see the consultant again and I think it was maybe a couple of months after that, after I mean. Uh, a battery of tests that, that he said, yeah, we've, we've diagnosed you with um, 
epilepsy. The, the blackouts to which you refer, for the benefit of listeners, what, what is that? How does it sort of, what, well, what's I the mean, sensation or the, yeah, the experience? How does, it, how does it manifest? I mean, I know now that there's so many different types of epilepsy and I would or still have what they call drop seizures. So it, I can only literally describe it as my soul leaves my body and what is left just drops to the floor. And then when I come round, I quite often don't know who I am, where I am, very confused. And, you know, that memory loss can, can last for, for anything from a few minutes to a few hours. And it then all starts to come back gradually, but not in any kind of chronological order. Uh, the medication on my own now has made it a lot better, but there, there are times where, yeah, it just it just happens. It's like a light switch. I, I don't actually know. I don't get a what they would call an aura or anything. It's just yeah, l lights go out, and then I kind of it's like it's like waking up. But I can only describe it like it's a little bit if you know if you've had a big night out on the beer. You don't remember going to bed and then you wake up, that kind of confusion of... of Start um, trying to almost sort of piece the night together. Yeah, Where have of, I been? What have I what, done? Yeah. Who have it's, I upset in it's my a, case? It's a little bit like that, yeah. And anyone that suffers from epilepsy will probably tell you, each time you have one, it's like having one for the first time. It doesn't kind of get easier. Do you see what I mean? You, yeah. I don't think you get used to it. So, um, so yeah, so it, it's... You learn to live with it, but I don't think you ever get used to having it. So those those blackouts to which you refer yeah. pre this this diagnosis, pre this holiday for this, in effect, that is that was it was a seizure. That's yeah. what you were having, but you just didn't you weren't aware. That's what it was termed at the I time. I was just massively in denial with all of it. Right. Yeah. So I just I'll ignore it and it'll go away. That was my philosophy at the time. And it was caused. To your point, by a you know a head trauma, a, yeah. a blow to the head, yeah, bang so, on the head. Yeah, I just I fell in my living room and hit my head against the coffee table, knocking myself out, and that triggered it. There is some speculation that when I was three, I had um, quite severe meningitis, and I had a seizure then. So the consultant said there's a possibility that you may have had epilepsy all your life, but so mild that you would. You'd never know. It, it would manifest itself in what you may call daydreaming, where you were just, you know, were you a kid that stared out the window at school, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so that that is a theory that, that it could could I could have always had it. Goodness. So, it, for for the benefit of listeners who perhaps aren't aware or don't understand what epilepsy might be, how do you define it? Well, I mean, epilepsy is a neurological illness and um, it, uh, it, it's basically um, like an electrical activity in your brain that then just, just kind of shuts your body down. But there's various different types of epilepsy. Some people only suffer seizures when they're asleep. Some people have what they call absence seizures, which is like the daydreaming, just staring into space. I think when we talk about epilepsy, everybody imagines the shaking Mm. seizures and uh, foaming at the mouth and that but that that I don't tend to do that quite a lot so um I have done but I don't I don't tend to have those kind of seizures I I tend to just drop wherever I am so, and and, it, and is it fair to assume therefore that so almost so every seizure could be different and it manifests for those that suffer from epilepsy in in a variety of differing ways so yeah. it's not like I don't know a diagnosis whereby a doctor is able to say to you, so this is what's happening, so this is what you would now expect. It's almost that uncertainty of this could, yeah. this could manifest in any one of a number of ways. There's that loads of different facets to it, and I don't, think, I don't think we really truly understand all of it. As you come out of a seizure, there's a, a stage called the post-dictal stage, which is actually the, the seizure's finished, but you're just coming out of it. And for a time, I, I used to go like walkabout, like sleepwalking, not knowing that I was doing it, there's there's low, you know, and it has this real big knock on effect because the anti seizure medication that they give you or, or or try you on, I mean, there's so many on the market now, but you tend not to take one. It's trying to work out that combination of two or three together that will best control your seizures. But then that has a knock on effect with the side effects. Like I'm quite often 
after I take it. Sometimes I feel overly tired and, and quite nauseous sometimes taking it. So that kind of, you know, has has that effect as well as the epilepsy. You have to then take this medication to help control your seizures. And and that's for life, right? That's that's something you're yeah, I suppose uh, depending on what advances might be made in research so yeah, and other treatments uh, that might come along. But as far as we are aware today, that's something that you will take now for the rest of yeah, your life. Yeah, I mean, there are surgical options. If they can find exactly where it starts in your brain, you can you can have the surgery to have that tiny piece removed and that can cure your epilepsy, which is quite an intrusive yeah. procedure. Yeah. With myself, because we can't manage my epilepsy with medication to a level that, that myself and the consultants would think is acceptable. We're talking about a surgery called VNS, which is uh, vagal nerve stimulation. So it has been shown that if you can stimulate the vagus nerve in your neck electronically, it can help reduce seizures. So they put a, a, a wire around the nerve, which is then connected to a battery pack in your chest like a power pack and then it repeatedly for example stimulates that nerve for three seconds every 30 seconds and that can and that can help so that's probably the next step for me can you remember the range of emotions how you felt if you like when that doctor sat across from you and said right we're going to put you on this this medication of epilepsy do you remember how you how that made you feel yeah, at that time i i it, in those situations, I think you all, you remove yourself <laughs> from from what's going on, and I just oh, this is just happening to someone else, and then my instinct is, well, let's just fix it. Let's okay, well, let's fix it. Let's what do I have to do to fix it? You know, that was my initial kind of feeling towards it, and then as we got on, and the medication wasn't fixing it, and I started to kind of lose kind of things in my life that was when it all started this is real now and this is this isn't like a thing that I can fix this isn't going away and and I'm not going to be able to do this on my own you know I, I, I'm going to have to rely on other people to to fix this for me mm. you know so yeah it was initially it was denial then it was like let's fix it and then, and then I just, I just spiraled into this pit of blackness. That's all I can really describe it as. As things started to be removed from my life, I, yeah, it was I, almost a sense of not caring. I don't care. I've got epilepsy now because I haven't got anything. You know. How has living with epilepsy affected your day to day life? I mean, what were some of the the, the bigger challenges that you were faced with initially? Well, it affects everything that you do i mean you learn to live with it but it's always in the back of your mind you know i, I haven't had a bath yeah you know i can have baths obviously if someone's with me yeah but yeah that, that kind of that kind of thing you know um i, you, I sit I'm down ashamed to say that never would have occurred to me but it makes yeah. perfect sense as to the reasons why you couldn't yeah. as you've explained but you you um sit down in the shower you sit down to use the toilet you know, anything, you learn these little things like to try and mitigate any form of injury that you would have in a fall. I mean, for a period of time, it just seemed that all of my seizures happened when I was on the stairs. I went, I went through a period of time where I, I, I was constantly having seizures on the stairs, ending up at the bottom. You and, know. and do you think people might think, is there a risk that people might ill-informed perhaps but might assume well look if you feel it coming on get to the bottom of the stairs is yeah. not an option is it i don't know that it's ha i don't know that it's going to happen some people get yeah. like an aura right they get like a funny taste in their mouth or all that i mean my partner says to me she can she can tell and and she will say that my personality can change sort of like half an hour to 15 minutes before before i have one but i wouldn't notice that if i was on my own so it's 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 we use the term epilepsy, but it just covers such a broad... It's like saying cancer. We all know what cancer is, but when you dive deeper and, and zoom in on it, there's so many different facets and different ways of treating it, um, and, and it is a little bit like that. Do you know, and I should have done the research, shouldn't I, but I'm stuck here, I'm curious as to how many people it affects. 
Um, Whether it's from the from a UK perspective or internationally, globally, how many people are? Uh, do they I think believe it's in? about one in one hundred. Goodness. Yeah. That seems high yeah. to me. Yeah, one I'm, in one. I'm reflecting on who have I met in my life or come across that I'd heard or knew. Yeah. Had been diagnosed with epilepsy. Yeah. Goodness, that strikes me as a significant proportion of people. And as you say, that would they that would they'd be wrestling with it in various forms. Yeah. But one in a hundred. It could be just like absent seizures or full on seizures. Their seizures may be controlled by medication. The unfortunate thing is is about epilepsy is there's such a stigma attached to it that a lot of people won't actually come forward and say that they've got it. Right. If you came across someone lying in the street, you oh, he's on drugs or yeah. he's drunk yeah. or, you know, it's it's one of those kind of situations. But yeah, there there is a massive stigma attached to it still, even, yeah. even in this day and age. This wonderful book, and we're going to come on to okay. talk about much of this, but but... You very kindly shared it with me. I've, I've, I've read it cover to cover. And there's a lot of talk about it's almost a systematic loss of everything you knew as a consequence, your health, your job, relationships. How, how did you cope? I mean, it, profound changes in your life. And how did you cope? Well, I was just getting married when I was diagnosed and there's a story in the book. Uh, the day before my, my wedding, I had a seizure on the stairs, was blue-lighted into hospital with a suspected spinal injury. That was the day before, before the wedding, you know. So I, I, was, I was almost embarking on a new life after a divorce. I was, um, was getting married, had this bang on the head. And in it, I mean, I, I guess it was gradual, but to me it was just like one hit after the other. So I lost my job was the, the first thing. I and mean, we've talked about this, and it's it's you describe it really the the the, the trauma of that the, the, this sort of loss to which we refer this trigger of a whole series of events. But you know, again, for the benefit of listeners, the the thought of losing your job first and foremost, without all the other things that followed. Yeah. But you know, life's life's good. You, you know, you do you perform you've got a great job, doing really well, yeah. traveling, you know, working in sales, traveling. Yeah. Nice holidays, all this, all nice this, car, yeah, and everything. All of a sudden, tr- like that, yeah. it changes in an instant. It has yeah. a massive effect, yeah. which I think, I, and I mention it, if only because I, I doubt people, certainly if they've never or don't know someone that's had to battle with this, wouldn't understand the implications, the wide-ranging implications of how this impacts your life. Yeah, I mean, I had a, I had a fantastic job, a job that I really enjoyed, had a nice car, excellent you know nice holidays we are kind of living that life that people i think would look at and go he's doing all right yeah good for you mate yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. i was and i was enjoying life as well that i think that was the the thing and then obviously was diagnosed with epilepsy got called into the head office and i'd been off work you know legitimately signed off while we were trying to kind of get it under control so i i um the accident happened in may and it was the following January that I got called into uh, head office. And they basically said, we've gone through your contract because you can't drive, which I can't. And you're working in sales as well, yeah. right? So you're on the road a fair bit, I'd imagine. We, yeah, uh, that's one of the prerequisites of your contract. We're, we're you know, we're going to let you go. And you just think, okay, well, what, what am I going to do now? And I remember flying home from Scotland because that's where the head office was. And I was, remember being on the plane going, how, how, how does this work now? What, what do I do? How, how am I going to pay all the bills and, you know, do all of this and et cetera, et cetera. And I guess I was fortunate in the nut that um, I had some money in the bank from the sale of uh, a home that I had. So I knew I had like a little buffer. So I didn't have to go down the road of claiming like a disability benefit, which I'd never done any of this I didn't know about universal credit or personal independence payment or anything like that. I, I didn't know what you did. What, 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 do, what do people do when they're sick and they can't work? I don't, I don't know. And so we had to go through that horrendous process of applying to get, to get this benefit and then being assessed by somebody and then waiting for, for them to come back and say, yes, you, you know, you do qualify and you can have this money and et cetera. But be under no illusion that it was going to be able to afford me any form of living or lifestyle other than basic survival, really. I was going to say, it would yeah. be, an, you're existing, but you're not 
yeah. living life, right? No, ex- exactly. It, 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 and it was quite humbling, if I'm being honest, yeah. to, to you know, have that. And, yeah, so, you know, I was like, well, okay, well, I've got epilepsy. We're de- trying to deal with that. Uh, and now I've lost my job. But also, um, as well, your independence. So you, yeah. people, you know, for the, again, for the benefit of listeners, but your, your driving license is, is removed. Yeah. And that's indefinitely or permanently when, when uh, first uh, diagnosed how, yeah, does, I mean, how does that play out you you have to submit your driver's license when you have epilepsy and then depending on how long you have it for sometimes you have to be seizure free for a whole year sometimes it's two years before you can get it back and then you have to apply to get it back and it's not that they're not necessarily guaranteed that you will so yeah that, that's a kind of long drawn out process but it was just this kind of you're kind of thrust into this i knew corporate sales i knew stress I knew long days, I knew nice holidays, I knew that's, that's what I knew, you know, socialising with friends, going to rock concerts, that's what I knew. I was now pushed into this other realm of, I don't know any of this. I, I, I'm basically, and I was having to rely on people after a seizure, you know, my wife at the time would have to dress me, put my socks on, you know, do all of that. Sometimes, you know, embarrassingly, you wet yourself. You know, so you, so that would all have to be taken care of. Um, my, so your dignity is impacted respectfully, but yeah. that, that is you're contending with all of these. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I was I was in in my early to mid forties. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't old <laughs> in my in my head. I wasn't old. I was, I was uh, yeah, and, and it just got layer by layer. It was just stripped away. So you know, you lose your health, and then the job. And then, so you're stuck at, as long as it's just stuck at home. And, and how much of a, you know, this, this, this phrase that, you know, not all disabilities are visible or whatever, they expre- you hear that expression sometimes. Yeah. So you to look at you, Gareth, you know. Exactly, You're a fine-looking yeah. man in a, you know, a private picture of health. You look yeah. great. And yet, actually, you're contending with something which is really debilitating and has had a massive impact on your life that yeah. people can't see. No, that's right. I wonder right. how that affects, because I think a daft analogy to draw, but if you break your leg... You have a cast on. Yeah. People go, oh, poor you, what you done? Yeah. Oh, that, you know, how long is that going to take to fix? And when you're back on your feet again and you, people have, there's a, there's an element of almost understanding and sympathy because people can relate to it. Yeah. You know, they understand if you break a bone, that's going to hurt and, but yeah, it's going to fix, right? But with the, with this. It's hidden. Yeah. It's hidden. And I guess therefore people, are they, I, I'd imagine some people are, are wonderful and very supportive and very understanding, but. Equally, some people may be cynical or questioning or because of that lack of understanding. Well, I, I, I'm lucky that I get a disabled person's rail card because I, because I have epilepsy. And when I go to buy my tickets at the thing and you hand it over, I do sometimes think the, the person that's selling you the ticket looks at you and goes, huh, really? <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, I might be making a bigger thing out of that, but I do sometimes get that impression because I'm not in a wheelchair you know, I, I haven't got a, another head growing out of out of my. You know, it, it, it's, it is completely invisible, mm. and I think it's only those friends and family around you that are close that actually know how debilitating it can be. Because you have the seizure, and that can last minutes, few minutes, ten minutes, but it wipes out the rest of the day. Sometimes the following day as well. You know, you're just, you're just so tired. You just you you have to sleep it off. And I'd imagine. The thing that strikes me as to what you're going through at that time is this word stress. You know, so the, the, the impact that stress has, you, you talked about prior, this, you know, doing the job you were doing and the stress that would entail, undeniably, you know, it's there. This is a, a more, I might argue, I'm not qualified to suggest a more dangerous type of stress because I'm, I don't understand quite what I'm saying when I phrase it that way, but... I'd imagine you're contending with, you know, the the worry, if you like, yeah. of well, where's the, where, how am I paying the bills? What do I do now? What does the rest of life look like for me? You know, all of these, the practical, you've got to go through this, you know, to your point around the benefits to which you're entitled and understanding that. And there just, just, I imagine you're just disappearing in your own head with all of this concern, which is then impacting your mental well-being. Your physical health as well, because yeah. stress can be a, a you know, a hor- does horrible things to the to the human body. That's just really traumatic. Yeah, I mean, traumatic at the time, series of events. It doesn't. It doesn't kind of feel like that at the time, but when you're when you're in it, 
um, I can only I can only describe it as you're you're at the center of something and it's just chaos all around you because there's a lot of the time it's um, family are looking after you, your backwards and the forwards being ambulance to hospital, who's picking who up, who's taking who to the hospital, how's Gareth getting back from the hospital, who's looking after Gareth tomorrow, who's you know, and it all of this is happening around you and I mean I mention it in the book I, I think. I resented eventually having epilepsy, but I think worse than that, I was resenting the people that were looking after me because I didn't want to be looked after. And I think that came out. I think that's an understandable emotion and place in which to find yourself, given that you've had all of your, you know, you live life, to your point, you're in your early 40s, right? So you've you've lived the the life of an independent family man, you know, and all that that would entail, that all of a sudden that gets stripped back bare to its rawest yeah, bare minimum of well, now you've got to rely on you've got to rely on other people now. Yeah, and actually, that's quite that strips you your soul bare almost. That's like rebuilding forty years of wiring that says this is what I do and how I think and how I behave and what I provide for my family and all those sorts of good things. Yeah, absolutely. It's all being called into question. You're having to rely on other people in a way that probably historically you didn't have to. I always found I always looked at myself as an alpha male. I travelled you know, Europe, climbing mountains. I did all of these, like, manly things, you know, and and the people that my friends were all of the same ilk. And then all of a sudden you're, you know, you're being lifted off the floor by your brother and your mum and you wet yourself and you're being carried to the sofa, you know, or you wake up and, you know, a paramedic is putting a cannula in your arm and all all of these things. Yeah, I mean, it was... It was just like a karate chop through through your life. You find yourself are you questioning your identity? Is that a is that a, a fair question? A fair assumption to make? Yeah, I think you do. I think you question everything, mm. uh, you know, about yourself at the time. And you, you, when when things like that happen, you you then don't recognise who you are anymore because you've kind of changed into into somebody else. You know, or it, it, it's a it's a strange kind of sensation and the strange feeling and I think what happened then was that just prompt this massive decline in 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 my own mental health which again I wasn't aware that was happening you know is there and again I've no evidence to support this but nonetheless I'm intrigued is there any evidence because we're going to come on to talk about the impact that it had on your mental health with all that you were contending with is there any correlation between something because certainly I believe that some neurological conditions have a correlation with things like depression, yeah, know, anxiety, I, those sorts of... There's a correlation that, that sometimes yeah. the, the impact on the brain can trigger that kind of, you know, switches off the dopamine tap, if you yeah. like, and doesn't give you the good stuff you need to have retain that balance. Is there any connection with um, I've epilepsy? not read any right. medical journals that, that, that say that, but I'm not, that's not to say that they're, they're not out there. But from my own experience... I would say, yeah. I, I don't think I didn't have any um, mental health issues prior to having epilepsy. Was it, you know, the bang on the head that prompted this, or was it just the, um, the social process of, of of kind of losing everything that then prompted this this decline? I, I, I don't know. You, you know, your your book beautifully and very bravely discusses your I guess I was gonna say it is it is a your 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 deteriorating mental health and and sort of in and becomes a deep depression and and some really dark times which culminate in an attempt to take your own life. Yeah. Um could you talk about what led you to that point? I mean I think people for for the benefit of listeners, many of you might be assuming well they would get it anyway, but given all you've been through, but what, what led you to that point? And, and I guess it, it, it always, the question that springs to mind was what was going through your mind? What, what got you to that point where you thought, this is the only way out? Yeah, I mean, um, it was, I was on a certain medication that was making me irritable. That was one of the side effects. That was causing problems within my relationship. And when we discussed this with the consultant, you know, the consultant would say to my wife, well, you have to remember it's not him, it's the it's the medication. But that's really difficult to do, isn't it, when someone's in your face shouting at you? Yeah. And so that started to creep in. I was having to rely on everybody to do everything. And then 
I kind of felt worthless. I became the complete person that I would... I came from that ilk of, what do you mean there's something wrong with your mental health? Pull your boots up, stop playing the victim and just get on with it, you know? You're attention-seeking. That I was from that ilk. I was Gen X, brought up that way, you know? You fall over and, and hurt your leg, you walk it off. Yeah. That was that was where I was from. But I, I found myself that I just couldn't get out of this dark place. I didn't want to leave the house because I had this like overwhelming anxiety. And I put that down to I didn't want to have a seizure in public. So I kind of ripped that off, you know. I, I was I was depressed. And I kind of wrote that off as well. Oh, I'm not depressed. I'm not, I'm not. And then I was left on my own in the house which at that time was quite a rare <laughs> occurrence. and um, Because people were concerned, concerned about... At me having a seizure, yeah. Right, okay. But not necessarily the concerns around your mental no, state at that no. time. And um, I had a seizure while I was on my own, and, and I, I managed to get myself upstairs and into bed. And I, and I remember just thinking, I can't, I can't go on. This is not... I, I don't want my life to be like this. I don't want my wife to have to be looking after me. I don't want my mum, who was approaching 70, to be running around after me all the time. I didn't want that. I don't, you know, it, 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 there just seemed to be this ca- all this chaos around me constantly all the time. And, you know, I, 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 I didn't want my two daughters to have a dad that had epilepsy. You know, when they go to school, what does your dad do for a living? Oh, my dad doesn't because he's got epilepsy. I didn't want them to, I didn't, didn't want that. I, you know, what, I wanted him to go to school and say, my dad works in commercial sales and he drives a Mercedes and he, you know, he, he, I just didn't want the life that I had. And because I was in that post-ictal stage of a seizure, I don't think I was thinking like, I, 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 don't, I can't talk about other people that have tried to take their own lives, but I didn't have to think about it very long. It, it was an instant decision. And it, and at the time, it felt empowering. Oh, this is something that I can do. This, this, will, this will fix everything. I, I can do this. You, you were in control of yeah. it? You weren't reliant on other people? people to fulfill, I, right. I'm, I'm in control of my destiny now. Yeah. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to wait and fall down the stairs and break my back and end up in a wheelchair, or I'm not going to wait for that to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort this out. I'm going to be a man. And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna sort this out now. And it, and I did it in an instant. I, I got up, I took a canvas belt that I had, um, wrapped it, threaded it through, wrapped it around my neck, tied it to the door handle, and then just laid on it. And I was out really quick. Yeah, it it was. When I look back on it now, it, it wasn't hard. It was. It was. It was an. I think. When people think of, if you watch films where people take their own lives, it's like they have this long drawn out tears and, you know, and I I think I was crying, you know, and they, you know, they they draw it out and uh, and then eventually it happens. Yeah, no, it wasn't like that. Just, it was a really quick decision and uh, I thought it was for the best everyone, you know. You felt uh, you were doing the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, and then it'll be over. I won't have to suffer anymore. Those around me aren't going to have to look after me anymore. And that would be, um, yeah, perfect. And, it, and in, in my own head, I'd rationalized it that, yeah, why, why didn't I do this before? You know, what, yeah. well, at the time, I didn't realize that I'd s- slipped into such a deep depression. I was quite, you know, I was almost excited if that, you've a, got an a, answer to a, yeah, this huge in a, problem in a weird way yeah. yeah so so yeah and that was that it was a it was a very quick decision and the irony now is that what we think happened and i describe it in the book is that the stress of doing it caused me to have a seizure which pulled the belt off the door handle so in an adverse and weird way, epilepsy saved my life. Yeah. So, so yeah. This, this, you know, incredible trauma you've experienced 
ultimately is responsible for giving you life back. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I came round. Um, I, I was laying in front of the door and um, I believe it was my mum and, and my wife at the time trying to push the door open uh, and then I you know I only this only got this sort of from my mum's recollection was they then reached through to try and push me away and they realized that there was something around my neck and then panic basically ambulance and all of that kind of stuff so yeah and I and I I guess once I'd come to my senses and I was the yeah, ambulance people put me on the bed and did all the checks and everything and then you look at the faces of the people that love you and then I realized that oh my god this, this that was what I thought was going to be <laughs> a release was was not it I could see that it it it, it almost aged people, do you know what I mean? I mean, I mean, my wife at the time and my mother were looking after me so well. I didn't realise that, but they were looking after me so well. And then to do this was just like a, you know, the ultimate betrayal, really. You know, they're there trying to keep you alive, you know, trying to help you, trying to, so you can manage your day, so you can do things and they run you around in their car, take you places and do all this. And then you go, you betray them by doing this and... Yeah, and I, and I think I slipped to another level of depression. Then I don't really? th I don't think that that was the the bottom of the pit. No, there is this. I mean, like I say, your the book you talk about it incredibly brave. I think you're incredibly brave to sit across from me here and and talk about it. The, I, I remember once somebody talking to me about about suicide. And that's used the phrase something like it doesn't, it doesn't stop the pain for people that have, have yeah. succeeded in taking their own lives. It doesn't stop the pain; it just passes the pain on. Yeah, exactly. I think I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm quite embarrassed about it. Obviously, you know, I don't want to sit here and talk about it freely. It, it's something that that again, I'm of that generation where you don't talk about your weaknesses. You know. But I think to get the story across, I think you have to understand where you were, you know, the catalyst of, of, of how it all happened with the epilepsy, losing your job, you know, trying to take your own life. You know, things were just rolling downhill and, 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 and there didn't seem to be any end of it, you know. And we've talked about this as well, haven't we? This sense of what people would not necessarily say to you, but that, that sense that people will say, oh, well, you've got to, you know, you almost got to hit the bottom before you yeah. can before you can bounce but back no but there was no bottom right there it's is no just bottom. Yeah. constantly piling on event yeah. after event after yeah. event after event yeah i think i think you know the wonderful thing about this book and there are many but one of the wonderful things i think is you get to a point in this book where you start to see through your narrative how you're realizing that you're getting to a point where you want you want to change you want you want to be able to regain back some of that control and accept that you've got these you've got an epilepsy you've got to contend with it it's it's a big issue but that you want to wrestle back some control for yourself and yeah. you start to i got that sense you really start to own it you really start to own it and take control of it and that's not you know it's not to say that there is a moment where you just go oh, i've got this now I've, I've sorted it i could it's a, it again becomes another step, another leg of the journey. And part of that is through this voyage of, you know, the rediscovery it almost felt like of the great outdoors. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with two brothers in, an, in a small market town in, in West Sussex. And we had access to um, a river that ran through it and fields. And we would spend a lot of time there. My grandparents lived right on the footpath that led down down to the river so we would spend a lot of time at my grandparents we would spend a lot of time in the summer holidays over this river and you know as, as I got older we would camp overnight and uh, I kind of liken it to like an 80s Huckleberry Finn kind of adventure and, th and that happened for quite a lot of summers you know and, it, and I really enjoyed that and while I was welded to the sofa I was kind of reminded of that by diving into the YouTube rabbit hole and seeing 
content creators going out camping and doing all that. And I would think, oh, yeah, I used to really like that. You know, didn't even have a tent. We just sleep in our sleeping bags and build a big fire and cook tins of beans and, and, and all of that. And, and as I watched more of this kind of camping, I thought, oh, man, I'd really like to do that. You know, I'd really, I'd, I didn't think it was going to help. It was just something like, oh, yeah, I used to, you know, I, I used to really enjoy doing that as a kid you know, and trying to relive some of that youth maybe. And when I finally did, much to the, uh, much to the, the worry of my, my mum and, and my family, oh my God, he's going to go out and sit in the woods on his own, you know, and is he mad? But when I did it, it was, it was, um, I, I don't know, I didn't think about epilepsy, I felt free. And I think that was the catalyst of, okay, well, I don't, I actually feel all right now. I don't feel like depressed. I don't feel sad. You know, I'm not angry, you know. I, and I kind of thought, well, maybe I need to do more of this. Is, it, is this helping? Because there are plenty of self-help books out there. But I think everybody's experience and everyone's situation is so unique to themselves. And everybody individually is so unique. I don't think you can blanket, try and treat people with this approach of, you know, I'll read this book, it will really help you. It, you know, it will help the person that wrote it, probably, but it was like a unique thing that did. And oh, I think also what happened was um, I, um, it was a point where everything up until that point had been horrible. And this was like the first thing that I'd done that I'd found some kind of enjoyment in. Was, was there a, a, a moment, because, you know, the, your attempt on your life was not, was not, as you say, there is no bottom. There was, yeah. a, was there a trigger that made you think enough's enough, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I'd had this accident, got epilepsy, you know, got depressed, decided to take my own life, you know. Luckily, I didn't succeed. Then I spent a night in a psychiatric hospital and I think it was that that woke me up and thought, how am I lying in a room on a crash pad with a thin blue blanket when, you know, six months ago I was sat in a really nice hotel with a client drinking nice wine and having a lovely dinner. And it's literally six months. I mean, it's that's yeah, the... Yeah, six months to a year from, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how, how have I gone Such from there? Such a short period of time. Yeah, and, and how have I ended up in a psychiatric hospital? How, how has that... How has that happened? Yeah. You know, how have you got... So I think it was then I decided... I'd... So there was, a, there was a moment when... So basically I, I got sectioned after an incident with the local police and um, had to be put under observation. And then I had to be assessed the following morning by three doctors. And they would either decide whether I was well enough to go home or if I needed treatment... And then they could hold me up to 28 days. And um, I, I arrived there early hours in the morning, uh, handcuffed, you know. It was just such a world away from where I was to, you know. And, um, you know, this is where you're going to sleep. Uh, there was a... Remember, like, the crash pads from school? Yeah. You know, that you, and uh, there was a, a little pillow and the a The blue thin mats blue, from That's from exactly school, that, yeah. yeah, the blue mats. And uh, a blanket... Uh, and then um, opposite was a, a big glass window with a nurse that was sat. Because I'd had a history of, you know, uh, I'd had a failed suicide attempt, so they I was, had to be observed, make sure I wasn't hurting myself. I couldn't sleep because I was just worried. Oh, my God, they, uh, you know, in my own mind, I was, you know, I was going to be, you know, it was like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, you know. I thought, oh, this is me now, this is it. And then the following morning, what happened was, what I didn't realise was the room that I was in was situated right next to the ward. And it was when the, the, these patients woke up in the ward in the morning that I realised that I absolutely do not want to be here and I do not ever want to come to this place again. These, these hospitals do great work with people that are obviously not in complete control of themselves. You know, they may have had some form of trauma or whatever, but they're... They are really mentally not well and, and are, you know, trying to be treated so they can be integrated back into society. And, you know, and that must take an awful amount of patience and empathy. But that morning, 
when some of these patients woke up, all they wanted to do was shout and scream. And that triggered somebody else shouting and screaming. And it was just this, you know, that um, it was almost like a caricature of the whole situation, if you could imagine. What do you think it's like being in a, in a they don't call them mental hospitals anymore, but what in that kind of institution place, what do you think it's like? That's, as you imagine it, that was what it was like. It was, it was a horrible experience. And I remember I was lucky enough to be able to go home that morning after being assessed. And I, in the back of my mind, I just thought, I'm never, ever coming back here again. Never. I, I've got to really try and do something now. Because every time I thought I was getting better, something would happen and I'd fall back. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't helping myself. I was just trying to rely on others to help me all the time. And, and it was on the drive home from, from that. Well, I'm, I'm never going back there. I'm actually going to go and try this wild camping in the woods for my own sanity, really, as, as strange as that sounds. And after the first night, I thought I'd like unlocked the door to... to you describe, I think there's a moment at which you're describing looking at stars, being under yeah. the stars. That's something that's just, just triggered a thought in my own mind. Yeah, yeah. Where it's that vivid sense of, and the calm almost that, that comes, that feeds yeah. through the narrative. Yeah. There's a sense of overwhelming calm and assuredness as to yeah. where you find it, yourself. It, it, it sounds... It sounds kind of almost very bohemian when, when I talk about it. But I remember laying, and I, I just had a little tarp over me so I could see the, the stars through the canopy of the trees. You know, and there was a gentle wind blowing. And I watched, the, and I didn't just look up and see the stars. I watched the star, I watched night I w come in. I watched the day leave and the night, night follow behind. And then the stars appeared. And then I just had this kind of, thought that my problems are just insignificant in this world the the enormity of it all you know was i i, I it's difficult to explain i just thought uh, i'm so insular at the moment with everything I'm, I'm, I'm really playing a victim here and then when you just look out and you just think oh there's just there's more there's so much more than just me in a front room and a tv watching youtube so yeah uh, and i think that was the catalyst to starting the journey. Let's talk about writing the book because I think it's often been described, writing a book often described as a journey in itself. You talk of a journey that you're on, but writing a book, as I say, a journey in itself. What do you think you've learned about yourself and, and in the broader sense, life in general, through the process of, of writing what the ruck just, just happened? Well, I think uh, we discussed this yesterday. I didn't write it chronologically. Mm. I wrote bits here and there and then kind of stitched it together at the end. And but when you were writing those bits here and there, were you at that point where you were thinking, I'm doing this because ultimately there's a book in it or were you just recording your thoughts? Yeah, I thought it was mentioned, you know, you would, you would bump into someone and, oh, how have you been? And you'd be like, Phew. <laughs> if you yeah. haven't seen them for like a year, <laughs> yeah. how have you been? And you were like, how long have you got? Because, you know, sit down because this is a roller coaster. And then it was mentioned, someone, oh, you should put that in a book, you know, because it's almost unbelievable to the, to, you know, to have so much happen one after the other, you know. It's almost like I, I would contend and it, to varying degrees people, but everybody has challenges of some description yeah. through their life. But for, I suspect for the majority, those challenges, they come and they go, they ebb and they flow. So that's just the ebb and flow of life, the highs and the lows. It's kind of like for you, it strikes me that everyone went, right, you can get 40 years and we'll give you all the good stuff you want. And then we're just going to give you 12 months where we're going to let you have it all and then some. Just yeah. bang, 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 bang. It was probably a couple of years. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I kind of run it through in my head, you know. I went through a horrendous divorce with my first wife, you know, sadly. You know, which is very, which I very much regret that that happened. Um, and then I was building this new life, and that was just taken away. And it, and it was just like a systematic loss. Yeah. Had an accident, got epilepsy. You know, lost my job. Tried to take my own life. Ended up in a, you know, uh, an institution for 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 a night. And then, just as I was kind of discovering, I think I might be able to get all this back. You know, you know, I spent, you know been out in the woods a couple of times and then my wife left I was like what else is going to be taken from me you know so I've got all of this and now I'm on my own I've got nobody now that's it what what, what am I going to do 
But f- fortunately at that time, I think I was just mentally better in myself to be able to cope with that. I'd been doing this wild camping, and I think it was that moment when, uh, when my second wife, for her own reasons, which were very valid, valid um, d- decided that she she couldn't do it anymore and left. It was the, I think it was that was the reason that I thought I'm going to write this book now because I think it will give me something to do because I'm going to be on my own for a lot of the time, and also I think I probably need to work through some stuff in my head. I think I need to, you know. Do you think it gave you a purpose? Yeah, a, a, a purpose. And I think what we're quite guilty of doing as people is something traumatic can happen to you and you think that you've thought about it and moved on from it. But I think what we do is we're very, we can convince ourselves that we're over something and and, and move on. Do, and do you I think, think we, we sort of bury it and we can yeah. squash it away somewhere and but not necessarily process yeah. it or deal and with I've it? and I've been doing that for a few years, thinking that I was... I was over all of this. I'd come to terms with epilepsy. You know, I'd come to terms with my wife leaving. And I don't think I was. And I think the book kind of forced me into rethinking some of these things. Because as you write them, you think, oh, yeah, you know, that was tough. I, you know, I didn't like that. I, you know, whereas before you just, ah, whatever, you know. There's a, one of the things that I love about the book is that the, is, is the physical challenges that you undertake and there's a there's a whole range you know running marathons and in, in respectfully in daft costumes and yeah. like you're, you're pushing yourself the fat the fan dance which for those that don't know is the special forces kind of yomp across the brecon beacons yeah. you know um in full kit you know you, you're up in the uh, in the highlands of scotland doing credible walks you know again sometimes on your own sometimes very ably supported yeah. by some wonderful characters in the book which We'll come on to yeah. uh, to name check some of those, but the, the challenges. You, how do you prepare for those challenges? How how do you cope with them, considering your epilepsy is still yeah, you know, and constantly looming large. So uh, I mean, I was now on my own, so I'd kind of learned to live or cope. Maybe would be the better word. Had these little kind of things, like I said earlier: sit down on the toilet, sit down in the shower. You know, uh, when I'm walking up the stairs, always lean a bit forward. You know, when I'm walking down the stairs, always lean a bit back. You you learn all of these kind of things. You know, we we would normally take for granted, right? If if um, if I'm at home on my own and I use the bathroom, I always leave the door open just in case anything happens. Because inevitably, in a in a bathroom, if you have a seizure, you fall in front of the door. No one can get in. So all of these kind of like you learn all these things. I wear a uh, fall alert detector, so my mum and and my brother know if I've had a fall at home, they get alerted. Um, So we we put all these things in place, and my confidence was getting better. I was feeling better in myself. I was doing these like little YouTube, I was making my own YouTube videos now, going out into the the woods and, and wild camping, and, you know, I... I kind of worked this routine. I discovered, uh, well, not discovered, but uh, an old friend of mine decided that he was going to keep me company on these wild camps and he's a real character. And I ashamed to say that I wouldn't have associated myself with him in a previous life because I thought, well, I'm not going to, do you know what I mean? It, and I think this new view that I had on the world and and of myself, you know, I, 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 reacquainted with a wonderful guy that would come out and 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 help me on these wild camps and it was then we decided hey why don't we go to scotland why don't we why don't we walk the length of loch ness let's do that you know and he was like yeah why not let's do that and just put it all planned it all you know where we were going to camp how we were going to get there you know what we're going to eat what happens if i have a seizure all of these kind of things. And yeah, it was good and, uh, and enjoyed it. And I think it was after that trip that um, I kind of thought, I can do more. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a wonderful insight. The book takes you beautifully on this journey of almost despair through hope, through happiness. That's how I would describe my experience as the reader. It kind of takes you down this, this you know, as I say, it is to the depths, the very depths, and then brings you back up really beautifully out the other side again and you get that sense you're you know of the journey on which you find yourself and 
supported by some wonderful characters. Yeah, you know, there are some. Uh, yeah. and you, you, you know, I think my sense is from reading the book that you have had that support from a wonderful array of, but your, your mum, your family, yeah. your brother. Emma, your other half, yeah. uh, you know, the, your friends, yeah. great, you know, the, the likes of Neil Natash, Turtle, Turtle you yeah. know, these, these people have been incredibly supportive and very much part of your your journey. Is that Yeah, I mean, I fair? think, I think uh, Neil and Turtle are very integral to the book. And I mean, you know, Turtle really adds the c comedy element of it. I mean... You know, whilst whilst on the outset the book might sound all doom and gloom and, and everything, there are there are some funny moments in it. There and, are and some he's, very funny and moments. And he's usually here. at the yeah. at the crux of it. And all. I, I, yeah. I couldn't quite determine as it actually my first thought might have been as I've met him, yeah, I could almost picture it. Yeah. But actually having had I not met him, yeah. the book's that vivid that that humour really still Yeah. You, know, yeah. you can still laugh as you as you're reading it, very much so. He's 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 an amazing person in his own right, very unique. And he's antagonizingly annoying. <laughs> a great friend will do anything for you, all rolled into one. You know, he's he's that he's that kind of person. And and I think what happened was on that first trip to Scotland, he had hurt his ankle and couldn't carry on. And and I had this moment of, do I dare do the next two days on my own? What would happen if anything was to happen? If I had a seizure, you know, that kind of that was that was the catalyst of of it all, really. And when I did do that, and I met Turtle back in Inverness two days later, in my mind, I was thinking, "Well, I've done that. What what is actually the worst that's going to happen? When I think about it logically, what will be the worst that 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 happens? You know? Do you, do you think that was a trigger to change perhaps that perspective that well, I can't do that because of epilepsy, whereas yeah. Well, actually, I can do anything. Yeah, uh, the epilepsy is still going to be there, but yeah. actually, do I? Is that fair? You do. Yeah, no. You I get that again as the yeah. reader. I got that sense that almost something flipped in you to say, actually, I could do that anyway, rather than I couldn't do that because of. Yeah, it kind of was an awakening moment, really, finishing the South Loch Ness Trail, doing the last couple of days on my own. Anybody that knows me knows that if I decide to do something, I always do it like two hundred percent. And after I'd done that, I was like, right, what's next? That was just a walk, you know. That was a 28-mile walk, you know. What's next? What can I do next that's a bit tougher, you know? And then I started looking at all these other things, you know. And it was, yeah, that was the roundabout, the kind of time where I um, was scrolling through Facebook. I saw an advert for an event called The Fan Dance which is part of the UK Special Forces selection process. It's a 28-kilometer yomp over the, 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 the Penavan mountain and back in military kit, where it, carrying a 40-pound you know, um, rucksack. And I, and I didn't even have to read all of the advert. I got halfway down the advert and just signed up. I thought, I'm going to do it. Of the, of the, and there are, there are many really fascinating challenges, but of those that you've undertaken is there one that stands out for you is that the one that stands out for you as being the one of which you're most proud if you like yeah i i and i mentioned this in the book i always finish these things slightly disappointed you know i think i'm always chasing some form of elation at the end i i like the the movie ending where they fi finish an event and people are like you know oh, well done, you know, backslaps and, you know, and all of this kind of stuff. And I don't know whether I'm looking for that, but I always get to the end and I go, that oh, was all right. Yeah. What's next? What do you know, that's, do that's, next? That's really interesting because I, so I had a lady on the podcast here called Jen Drummond. So she's the first woman to have climbed the seven second summit. Okay. And I was talking about a similar thing where it's kind of, so you get literally get to the top of the mountain. How does that feel? And it's kind of like, eh. yeah. She said, you're on top of the mountain for maybe five minutes, yeah. maybe 10. You have a look around, you breathe it in, you're kind of wowed, but you're tired. So you've got that kind of strange sense of elation and exhaustion. And then the realization you've got to get back down again. Yeah. Uh, and you turn around, you go, and you kind of go, so actually what, and we talked about this sense of the moment where we're sort of seeking, and it's quite common, I think, with human nature, where we perceive the destination 
is where the elation, the, you know, the movie moment arrives. Yeah, yeah. All the high fives and you, you've made it. Actually, what's been consistent through everybody with whom I've spoke is, is actually the journey. It's yeah. the one step in front of another and that sense of, of absolutely being present through it is where the real reward comes. But we yeah. don't necessarily see it because we're always seeking the summit. Yeah, no, I, 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 I always feel, I would say always a little, okay, did not disappointed but okay it's not quite the next the the the, the, you know the high five moment you imagine it's going to be in your mind is it i mean that first because i've done the fan dance twice now but that first one will always stick in my mind as the moment of because before like you know a hike through scotland was was it's tiring but it's not it's not an endurance event is it um and then booking onto the fan dance having to train for that and I and it was in that training that I learned myself how to probably come to terms with everything that had happened. The the because I don't train listening to to music. I don't run with music or anything. Um, it, it was those early morning rucks in the in the woods before everyone would get up because I didn't like. I had this routine of I have to take my medication at eight o'clock in the morning and I know I'm going to feel terrible for a couple of hours after that. So then what happens is, um, so what I would do is I would get up at four o'clock in the morning, I'd do a 10 mile rug around the forest, come home, take my medication, shower, change, go to bed. And, I, and I'd got into this routine, but it was those dark mornings where I, I would think about stuff because that... that um, Running with a a, a forty pound pack isn't easy, mm. you know. Running isn't easy if over a long period, you know, long distance. But and so I was learning how to to do all of this, and it was when when my mind was telling me, "Please stop this. You're not doing yourself any favors here. You know, legs are hurting, backs hurting, shoulders are hurting, can't breathe, lungs on fire." You know, and 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 that internal voice that's trying to basically bring you to a stop. I would think about all those parts of my life where I'd made wrong decisions. I'd think about my children a lot, and other kind of traumatic experiences, the epilepsy diagnosis. And what I would do is I would attach that pain that I was feeling at that time to that emotion. So I was thinking of something where. In a previous life, I wouldn't have thought twice about, uh, you know, whatever, you know, she'll get over it. I, I was now a, attaching a form of pain to it. And I think some people might say that's a form of self-harming, but it was it was therapeutic for me because I was reliving experiences and then feeling some form of pain that was the consequence for it as well. So whether that's healthy, I, I don't know, but that's what... And I do it even now when I'm out training or... I'm running or, or doing it, and I want to stop, I'll think about those moments. And that's then what keeps me going. The, um, the future. What challenges are you looking forward to next? What, what are your hopes and aspirations for the future? Well, it's, um, it's uh, I mean, the strap line for, you know, the book was losing everything wasn't the end, it was just the beginning. And I found myself now at the end of something else. So the end of finishing a book, and, and putting it out and obviously the book culminates in you know running the london marathon in military kit boots and a 40 pound burden you know the almost the pinnacle of endurance events is the london marathon really and um i thought that was a great place to to finish the book and and a lot of people are saying what what's next so that i've had a long period of time getting the book finished and getting that out and I've got uh, the fan dance again in January, which is the winter one. So again, another level of endurance on top of it. You know, if it's not difficult enough already, yeah, it's at now throwing some horrific weather so conditions we'll, yeah. to contend with as well. So there, there's that, and uh, and a couple of other events. And I, I, I find myself now really at, at a crossroads. One thing that writing the book uh, I've discovered is I have a love for writing. The book came out of me easy. I, I. Uh, you actually you enjoyed the experience, I, I, I enjoyed even though it was painful. Clearly, at times, yeah, it was therapeutic. It 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 did make me think about some things, you know, 
that I maybe should have thought about a long time ago. I quite often, probably still do today, think that my epilepsy and everything that happened after it was like a penance for the life that I'd been leading up till then. I felt, still do feel, it's almost like a pun. It was like a punishment. And I think what it's made me do is to come to terms with trying to forgive myself. It, well, like I said yesterday, it's not about forgiving yourself. It's about learning to live with it and then moving on. And I, and I find that that's where I am now. I'd like to write more. Is there a second book? Maybe. I've got lots of things in the pipeline, more events. I mean, when we're talking about loss and, you know, being repeatedly kicked in, in, um, in August this year, I had a seizure on holiday and lost all my hearing. Uh, and I've had to then go through the process of, of, trying, of living with being practically deaf. But I was much better set up to cope with that through the, all the experiences that I've been through before. So moving forward, yeah, I think I'm going to write more, possibly go into some form of, uh, I wouldn't say motivational speaking, but, you know, maybe telling my story uh, in a more open setting, to not to motivate people or to inspire people, but, you know, just to, for people to think, oh, it's not just me. That's not just me that that's happened to. I was fascinated to understand as to perhaps what message you might give others who are facing adversity. Is there a message that you'd like to, to share with others that, as I say, people who might be facing their own struggles, be it with health, loss, life challenges in general, what would you say to them? We often, at the beginning of these things, feel that we we look about for people to help us. We look about, we want somebody to do something, you know, take my epilepsy away or take my cancer away or take, you know. But the reality is you have to do it yourself. And I am not, and I don't want people to have the impression that I am some kind of endurance athlete that that goes out and does the fan dance, runs a marathon, does all of these events, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, uh, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't want people to think that that's easy. Absolutely, it's not. It's, the hard, it, it's hard. I think I come back to the book again. It's very clear yeah. as you read that it's exactly that, that in the events that you're undertaking are of themselves tough to overcome, tough to get through. Yeah. Because to your point, you know, respectfully, but you're not an endurance athlete, that no. just not, and that's not why you're doing it. No. So there is, there is still that sense of it's back to one foot in front of the other, one step at a time. Yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it's like running the, the marathon. You know, when you try and change your life, you're inspired. You, you have this epiphany. All right, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to sort things out. For the first few miles, it's easy because you're motivated. You're new. And then it, gradually on, it, it gets a bit difficult. And then as you're coming to the end, you're, you know, like in the marathon, I was thinking... I'll get to that lamppost. And when I run to that lamppost, right, I'll run to that sign at the end of the road. And when you get to that, right, I'm gonna you 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 take you tend to bite off big chunks at the beginning, but as you go further through, you have to take smaller chunks mm. and, and do it. And it and it all doesn't happen as you want. It's just it's about it's about not giving up. And I know that sounds really corny, you know, just don't don't let that enter your mind and be an option. Just don't give up. You know, I would say to people, running the London Marathon, you start and you finish, and in between, what you're literally doing is persuading yourself not to stop. That, that is essentially what that is. And I, and I think that maybe that's the inherent in my personality that I treat everything like a competitive sport. I don't like to lose. I set high expectations for myself um, and I fall short of them all the time and falling short of them all the time is what drives me on to do more. So I don't think it's a clear message. It's just, you know, whatever you decide to do, don't give up. You know, someone more intelligent than me said, if all your dreams were going to come true, how big would you dream if you knew you were never going to fail? And I think that is the, the catalyst of, of what you need to do. Don't think big, shoot for the stars, and don't give up. And if I can get through that as a, I say in the book, I'm average. I'm good at lots of things, but I'm not great at anything, you know. 
if I and if I can do it, it I think it's within everybody to be able to to find that that little that little bit of sort of hope to hold on to and, and just keep going with it. Well, it's a it's a real story of hope, adversity, inspiration. Is how I would describe the yeah. journey for what the ruck just happened. It's a it's a great read. Uh, where can listeners go to buy a copy? Where should we be um, sending them? It's available on Amazon, pretty much in every territory where Amazon available is available. Um, yeah, it's in paperback and hardback, and uh, in the new year will be um, on Kindle and hopefully later on uh, audiobook. Well, Gareth Delator, it's been a pleasure to have you as my guest here today. Enough. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Appreciate your time. You're a genuine source of inspiration. Um, Thank you. And I congratulate you on all you continue to overcome. It's a, it's a great message that you that you uh, you impart and share. And I really appreciate you coming on today to share it with listeners. It's been lovely to be here. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Great to have you. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening to today's Astrology podcast. I really appreciate your. Uh, audience and ears Uh, if you've enjoyed it then uh, why not hop onto itunes and give us a review i'd really appreciate anything that you might have to say any feedback always gratefully received and uh, look forward to hosting you next time see you soon Just a reminder, today's podcast is brought to you by Progresso Talent Partners. Visit www.progressotalent.com today for more information.